My daughter and I moved into the fourth floor unit of the Angel Trace apartment complex a few months ago. The seven-story building jutted up into the smog-filled, dreary sky like a tumor. This town of Frost Hollow seemed like it constantly rained, and no matter how high I turned up the heat in the apartment, I always felt cold. Surrounded by condemned factories and dead leafless trees, the area around Angel Trace looked depressing enough to suck the life out of even the most optimistic person. The streets always stayed dreary and empty. My neighbors around the apartment complex would walk around, hunched over and glassy-eyed, looking as depressed and hopeless as an inmate heading to the gas chamber. I would catch glimpses of something extremely thin and tall, a pale form barely visible in the blackness, slinking its way through the dark room when I laid down to sleep. But whenever I looked over, I would find just an empty wall of mocking shadows waiting for me there. I started to wonder if perhaps I was hallucinating. I wondered if there was something in the walls of Angel Trace itself some sort of black mold or toxic chemical that would cause me to see things that weren't there. Angela was home from school for Christmas break. Though our place was small and dingy, pressing in on me like a coffin, Angela didn't seem to mind in the slightest. Daddy, how long do you think we're going to stay here? Angela asked in a high-pitched voice of a curious seven-year-old. I grunted and shook my head, taken aback by the question. Angela was sitting at the pockmarked and scarred kitchen table, coloring a picture with markers. I glanced out of the small kitchen window. The ancient yellowed glass changed the world outside into a sickly piss-colored hue. After heaving a deep sigh, I turned to Angela, meeting her glacier blue eyes. Until I can get caught up, I said weakly, shrugging. I'm sorry, but this is all I can afford right now. Everything's going to be hard for a while for both of us, I think. Angela blinked quickly, looking confused. She put a warm hand on my arm and leaned close to me. But I like it here, Daddy, she said, giving me a wide smile, her large eyes sparkling with happiness. I have my best friend here. I gave her a double take. I hadn't seen any other kids her age in the building. Who? I haven't met your friends yet, I said. Is it a kid who lives in the building with us? She shook her head, rolling her eyes at how slow and dense her old dad was. Well, my best friend is called Mr. Slither. I see him in the mirrors all the time. He's funny, Daddy. He's really tall and has these black clothes on. His face is empty because his eyes are on his hands. There's nothing on his face but a big smile. Mr. Slither is always happy and smiling. Angela murmured excitedly, pointing her small hand at the bathroom. What do you mean his eyes are on his hands? I asked. Angela raised her hands to me, her palms outwards. They're right here, she said, pointing to the exact center of each palm. They're really big too, and they never blink. I don't think Mr. Slither even has eyelids. Kinda weird, but I know Mr. Slither would never hurt me. He's a gentle giant. I laughed relieved. I realized she was just talking about an imaginary friend. You have quite an imagination, kiddo, I said, grinning at her as I ruffled her straight black hair. I used to have an imaginary friend when I was your age, too. His name was Blinko. I thought back with nostalgia, remembering the clown I had imagined and spent hours playing within those lonely years. Actually, looking back on it, it was a slightly creepy undertone, now that I thought about it. Perhaps having creepy imaginary friends just ran in the family. 
Mr. Slither isn't imaginary. Angela cried defensively, her pale eyes blazing with a childish sense of indignation. For a moment, though, she looked much older than Seven. He's real. At night, he comes out of the mirror and plays with me sometimes. Uh-huh, I said, nodding. Okay, Angela, you're right. Mr. Slither is real. Now go to bed. Santa's coming tonight. I looked down at my watch, seeing it was almost midnight. Christmas would be here soon. After I read Angela a story from Grimm's Fairy Tales and tucked her into bed, I was sitting in front of a 24-hour news channel, watching the same segments over and over told in slightly different ways. Insomnia had been my constant companion for years, ever since my wife, Angela's mother, had been murdered in her old home. I had come home from mini-golfing with Angela to find a scene from a nightmare. My wife's body had been laying on the living room floor, slumped and leaning against the front door, as if with her last dying strength she had tried to drag herself outside for help. Her throat had been slashed from ear to ear, nearly severing her head from her body. The pool of blood that surrounded her like a mystical aura gave the air a smell of copper and iron, mixed with the reek of panicked sweat. She had been stabbed dozens of times in her chest, neck, and stomach. I remember Angela's wail as she saw what remained of her mother laying there like discarded trash on the floor. In my dreams, I still see my wife's sightless eyes and hear that horrified childish screaming. And that's why I believe I rarely sleep anymore. And when I do, I always see horrible things. I felt my eyes heavy and everything felt slow as I sat there on the recliner. The TV screen flickered with its incessant babble. When was the last time I had gotten a good night's sleep? Maybe a couple of weeks ago, but I couldn't remember. My brain felt sluggish and far away. I closed my eyes and for a moment, my head drooped. Sleep started to take over like a blanket, covering my body in its warm embrace. Though deep down, I knew dark things swimming deep under the surface of my cautious mind waited for me there as well. A sudden pounding on my door caused me to jump, a feeling like electricity running through my body as a rush of adrenaline made me fully alert. I raised my head, blinking fast. Someone started screaming, a woman's voice, high-pitched and full of terror. I couldn't make out many words except for help and get it away. I ran over to the small, dingy apartment to the door. Without hesitation, I flung it open. A young woman in her 20s with the look of a gypsy stood there. She had dark red lipstick slashed across her lips and eyes that looked painted on and ancient, like those of a doll. Makeup blanketed her tanned skin. Dark rivulets of mascara dribbled down her high cheekbones. She ran past me into the apartment, slamming the door shut before I could even react. I saw she was dressed in skin-tight leather and high heels as if she was coming from a club, or perhaps working as an escort. Thank God you answered, she cried, grabbing my shirt, her eyes frantic and haunted. A brief flash of recognition flashed through my mind. I had seen this woman before, had even talked to her briefly and introduced myself. I remembered her name was Crystal, though the last time I had glimpsed her in front of the building, she had not been dressed like this. What is it? I asked. Why are you here? She leaned forward, and I could smell alcohol on her breath. There's someone in my apartment, she whispered, 
Or maybe I should say something. I don't know. I got back from work and when I opened the door, it stood there in the darkness. It was dark, but I could tell it was huge. Its head nearly scraped the ceiling. Its head jerked towards me, but it looked as if it had no face. God, it was horrible. I shook my head, disgusted. You smell like pure booze, I said, frowning. What are you, doing drugs? I don't need this crap in here. I have a kid. You need to leave immediately. She shook her head frantically. I swear to God, this is real. Go look, please. Crystal wailed. She grabbed me with her freshly painted nails. They gleamed in the dim light, blood red and glossy. Suddenly, Angela was standing in our short hallway in her pajamas, looking half asleep. Her eyes moved blarely from me to Crystal and then back to me. Daddy, what's wrong? She asked in a soft voice. Who's this? Okay, you need to leave right now. I said, pushing Crystal towards the door. I flung it open. I saw in wonder that the hallway outside had gone completely dark since Crystal had first ran into my place. All of the lights had just winked out, as if the power had been cut. Only a few slivers of moonlight shined in through the hallway windows offering any illumination at all. There was a strange smell too. An odor that hadn't been there a minute earlier when I had let Crystal in. It reminded me of a combination of vomit and antifreeze. And it was overwhelming. It emanated from the hallway so thick that I could taste it at the back of my throat. Gagging, I stumbled away from the open door. Oh god, that that's the thing. Crystal whispered grimly next to me. That's the same smell I noticed when I opened my apartment door. It must be close. Crystal backpedaled away from the threshold that looked in on us like a dilated pupil. She slammed into a wall, knocking a family photo to the ground where it shattered. I continued staring in the darkness, slowly backing away. Something seemed to move in the shadows, like currents of blackness swirling in the void. I heard someone scream from out in the hallway, an old man's quavering voice. There was a pounding of footsteps, then someone ran past my door. I caught a glimpse of a man in a white bathrobe with deep slices across his face and neck. Fat drops of blood collected and scattered over his thin frame as he hobbled forward, staining his bathrobe in splatters and blotches. I heard a predatory shrieking from directly outside. An inhumanly long arm stretched out across the darkness, the pale skin shining like bones in the moonlight. With a cry of agony and terror, the old man got dragged back. The sharp pointed fingers were embedded deeply into his skin like ticks, creating fresh streams of blood that spurted from the stab wounds. With a rising sense of revulsion and horror, I slammed the door shut. What the F is that thing? Crystal whispered as tears streamed down her face, smearing her makeup and mascara. Angela whimpered softly behind us. I ran over to her, wrapping my arms around her in a tight hug. It's okay, baby, I said in her ear. We're going to get you out of here, I promise. No, Daddy, you don't understand, Angela said between sobs. That's Mr. Slither. I don't know why he's doing this, though. He told me he was hungry, but I thought he meant food. I pulled away from her quickly, holding her at arm's length. Her small lips quivered with emotion. Tears pulled in her deep blue eyes. I just shook my head, unbelieving. I pulled out my cell phone, calling 911. It rang a couple of times before someone picked up. We need help immediately. I whispered frantically into the phone, a great sense of relief washing over me. 
now at least, it would be the authority's problem, not just mine. Please, there's someone attacking people at... That's me in. A ragged voice hissed on the other end of the line. Let me in or I'll break in, and that will be very unpleasant for all of you, I can assure you. The thing's voice came across as gurgling and deep, as if some sort of acid had eaten away at his vocal cords. My trembling hand dropped the phone to the ground as the electricity in my apartment cut out, plunging us into darkness. Is it real? I whispered in the silence. The dim light of the phone illuminated Angela's face in a ghastly glow. She continued the cry and whimper, apologizing over and over. I stumbled over to her, holding her close. Baby, whatever's happening, it's not your fault, I said, trying to reassure her. Her small body continued to tremble as I held her. Crystal came over to us, confused. What's she talking about? She asked. I shook my head. It's nothing. It's her imaginary friend, Mr. Slither. She thinks he's come to life and it's hunting people or something. I said. Angela pulled away, anger coloring her pale cheeks red. He's not imaginary, she said, nearly shouting. I winced. Okay, okay, I believe you, but please stop yelling, I whispered, fear gripping my heart. Whatever kind of animal or whatever that is outside, we don't want to draw its attention. Crystal knelt down in front of Angela, her expression open and believing. Are you telling the truth, Angela? Crystal asked. Have you seen that thing before? Have you ever talked to it? Angela nodded, suddenly looking scared and recalcitrant. Okay, well, if you've talked to it, did it tell you what it wants? It's a he, Angela whispered grimly. Not an it. His name is Mr. Slither, and he likes to play. His favorite game is hide and seek. I picked up my phone, using the dim light from the screen to see my way. I looked back towards the door, realizing it now stood open. The shadows of the hallway danced and fluttered as I flicked my light in that direction. On the threshold of my doorway, I saw fingers wrapped around the edge, spidery and as sharp as scalpels. The bone-white skin looked so smooth that it didn't seem real, almost like the skin of a mannequin. The hand jerked, twisting towards us. In the center of the palm, I saw an enormous eye. It was as dark as obsidian. It looked from me to Angela to Crystal and then slowly, the arm drew back into the hallway and disappeared. Hide and seek, I whispered, herding Angela and Crystal into the bedroom. I turned and locked the door, my heart beating a frantic runaway rhythm in my chest. I felt like I might pass out from all the fear and stress. I leaned on the counter, breathing heavily. We're on the fourth floor, Crystal observed. It could be worse. If we're playing hide and seek, then we're probably just need to go outside, right? How hard could that be? I gave her a look as if she was insane. Did you see how fast that thing was? How sharp those fingers were? They looked like knives. I wouldn't want to get in a fight with that thing. I looked over at Angela a sense of wonder coming over me. She had been right after all. She had described Mr. Slither as having eyes on his hands, and he had. Angela, do you think you could talk to Mr. Slither? Maybe, maybe calm him down and let us go. She shook her head, terror ripping its way across her pale face. No, Daddy, he's never been like this. He's always been nice. He would play with me all night sometimes. He's really good at Jenga because his fingers are so long and narrow, Angela said, shrugging. I don't know why he's doing this. Maybe something's imitating Mr. Slither or gotten inside him. 
I felt skeptical. Well, we can't just stay in here all night, I whispered grimly. We have to go out. Why? Crystal said, almost petulantly. Why can't we stay in here all night? I'm not going out in that frickin' hallway with that thing killing people. Are you totally nuts? Do you want to die? No, I said. And that's why we need the move. If he's playing hide and seek, then he already knows where we are. It's only a matter of time until he comes in here and the game ends for us. As if on cue, I heard a floorboard creaking outside in the apartment. Goosebumps ran all over my skin, as if a freezing wind had just blown in the room. While I didn't have any guns, I did have a bowie knife that I'd bought for hiking. It had a giant blade and a silver handle that unscrewed to reveal matches and a compass. I grabbed it, my knuckles turning white with tension as I held the knife in my iron grip. The lock of the door started to turn, as if by itself. The door creaked open slowly. Crystal pulled out her phone, shining the light towards the threshold. Let's do this, I whispered. I started towards the door with stiff legs, having to force myself to take every step. Crystal and Angela were huddled close behind me as I shone the light into the apartment. To my relief, I saw nothing there. We're going to make a run for the stairs and get the hell out of here, I said. Go! Without waiting to see if they would follow, I took off across the apartment and out into the hallway, shining my cell phone in front of me to see. The old man's body was strewn across the floor. To my horror, I saw his jaw had been ripped off and his head twisted around 180 degrees. He had a grisly death mask of terror eternally frozen on his mutilated face. The stairway was only 30 or 40 feet away. I was ecstatic, having seen no sign of the abomination. I glanced behind me, seeing Angela and Crystal not far away. Everything was going perfectly. As we got close, the stairway door flew open with the crack like a gunshot, slamming hard against the wall. Mr. Slither oozed over the threshold, dressed in a silky black robe that fluttered around his inhumanly tall, emaciated body. Staggering, his joints twisting and cracking, he came forwards, one arm extended out as the eye in his palm gleamed like shadows. All three of us turned to run. I sprinted past Crystal, pushing Angela forward as I went. We leapt over the body of the old man, blindly turning the corner. From behind me, I heard something heavy fall with a whooshing of breath. I glanced back, seeing Crystal had stumbled over the old man's body. She started crawling forwards as Mr. Slither glided down his next meal, his bone-white face grinning with pleasure and bloodlust. Don't you dare leave me here, you freaking a-hole! Crystal shrieked at me as I sprinted away. Then the screaming started, echoing through the halls with incomprehensible pain. We heard Crystal's screams get cut off abruptly. They were followed by a sickening, choking, gurgling sound. Shaking and terrified, I pushed Angela forward towards the emergency exit. We spiraled our way down the stairs without looking back. We had a head start on Mr. Slither now at least, though I didn't know for how long. The pounding of heavy footsteps closed in behind me. I heard Mr. Slither give a predatory shriek that gurgled like pneumonia. Angela and I had made it to the first floor. I smashed through the door, the metal slamming hard against the wall. The exit was so close, just down the hallway. Angela was weeping, and I was praying. Another 40 feet, and we would be out. 
I felt the clawed hands close around my shoulder suddenly, pulling me back and off my feet. They stabbed deeply through the skin and muscle. Mr. Slither turned me to face his eyeless abomination face. I raised the knife, stabbing it into the top of his head. Gray blood the color of granite exploded in a waterfall from the wound as the knife stuck there, vibrating. Mr. Slither didn't react in the slightest. The mouth split open, showing hundreds of fangs that grew like tumors from his blackened gums. Gnashing and biting the air, he drew me towards that mouth, and I knew I would die. Mr. Slither, don't take my daddy! Angela screamed, running towards the abomination. Take me instead, we could play together forever! Mr. Slither's fingers seemed to tighten around my shoulder, digging deeply into the flesh like venomous fangs. A cold burning sensation shot through my body. I gagged as he dropped me. I fell to my knees, feeling his fingers still clawing my flesh, when he suddenly relaxed, releasing me in an instant. He turned towards Angela, putting his hand out in front of his body to watch her with a single black eye. You would want to spend eternity with me? Mr. Slither gurgled in his infected voice. Angela nodded, hugging the black-robed figure. Mr. Slither put his hands on her back uncertainly, then started patting her gently. His pointed alien skull split into a wide grin with a cracking sound. Angela, no! I cried as blood poured down my chest. My clothing stuck to my skin as it soaked into my shirt and blotches. I tried to pull myself up, but I felt weak and sick. Crouched on the ground in the darkness, I could only watch in horror as they walked off down the hallway together hand in hand. I would never see Angela again. <laughs>